I am Shua. And you are listening to Light Up with Shua. A weekly podcast to open our hearts and minds on a journey with me. Hello. Welcome. I have here Reverend Rodney L. Peterson, Ph.D., who is an executive director of Cooperative Metropolitan Ministries and executive director of the Lord's Day Alliance in the U.S. and a research associate at Boston University School of Theology. He is formerly executive director of the Boston Theological Institute. But instead of going into his complete bio at this moment, I would like Rodney to talk about himself, his work. Thank you for taking our time. I would want you to tell me about yourself sure. in your words and your work and delve into the main topic that I have today about parenting. So please, Rodney, go ahead. Well, thank you, Shwa Arshad. It's a pleasure to be here together with you and especially to participate in a conversation such as this. Uh, how interesting a character I am or not is up to the audience, <laughs> but I will say a word about myself. I grew up in the Great Valley of Democracy, uh, as called by William Jennings Bryan, the central part of the country. I, my natal city is Chicago, Illinois, and I grew up in a very warm and welcoming atmosphere with parents that, uh, from whom we felt a great deal of love and care. Uh, a church that seemed uh, as interested in mission as it was in the building, and um, w with an educational background that was second to none. So I feel myself very privileged from my background. I went to Harvard College and then uh, pursued a degree in history. I've always been interested in the question of values, the values we have as individuals, and the values we have as a society. So that after my undergraduate degree, I continued on with a couple of master's degrees and then did a doctorate in history at Princeton. I taught for a while uh, in a seminary in the Chicago area. I taught at a university in Switzerland, and then I became director of the Boston Theological Institute for 25 years. Wow, that is a big achievement. Awesome. So and you had been around the neighborhood. <laughs> that shows. And consortium is like uh, covers a lot of uh, schools and colleges. We had ten schools in the consortium by the time I left. It made possible cross registration in all of the schools, interlibrary usage, and then we did a number of conferences both abroad around the world as well as at home conferences that dealt with the question of religious values and values, generally speaking, as people are trying to come to grips with what it means to live together in this very complex society and world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So I would just go ahead and ask you, what do you really like about your work that you have been constantly in this area, this field, for so long? I love the relationships and the people I meet. Uh, people are where it's at, and the importance of relationships undergirds every different kind of uh, facet of our life, whether as parents, whether as people in community, whether a nation, whether our international relations. Relationships are key and are very important. Thank you. So let's go to parenting. So I'm sure you have, uh, looking at your bio and your accomplishments and what so far you have said about relationships, I would like to know what kind of relationships, relationship do you have with your children? And how many children do you have? I have four children, three boys and a daughter. They range in age from 34 to 14. Wow. So they're spaced out. That's nice. And uh, they're wonderful children. Uh, one is uh, working uh, remuneratively, two are still in college, and one is just entering high school. So what's your relationship with them? Like, well, how did you create that bond if you have a bond? So let's start with how would you describe what kind of relationship do you have with your boys? And is there any difference between the boys and the girl? 
Alas, this may not be politically correct, but there is a difference between boys and girls. Okay. <laughs> but I think to answer your question in brief, um, spending time with each child is important, as well as doing something special with each child. With my oldest son, we climbed Mount Rainier together, and that was a very bonding experience. Uh, with the other two boys, um, we did Boy Scouts together, and I became a Boy Scout leader and took them to Philmont, the Boy Scout camp in New Mexico, for a two-week uh, hunker-down, all-bars-pooled uh, hike mm -hmm. uh, up several different mountain peaks. Uh -huh. With my daughter, I didn't take her on a mountain, although I'd be glad to do so. But I took her when she graduated from high school to Rome in Assisi. She's very interested in the arts and in the environment. Okay. So I was invited to speak at a conference on spirituality and sustainability. And I thought, how can I go to a conference like that without bringing my daughter? When did you take her? Well, how old was she? She was, she, she's 14. I, did, uh, I took her just this summer. Okay, so she, so she I understands her, what she's... Oh, she understands brilliantly. I asked her at the end of her uh, uh, eighth grade experience whether she wanted to join her class and visit the White House and the president or whether she'd rather go to Rome and visit the Pope. She said, Dad, that, that's a no-brainer. I'd much rather go to Rome and Italy and uh, go to Assisi. And the conference on environmental issues, I thought would be over her head, but she was fully engaged from the moment uh, it started, and in fact was asked to give a 10-minute talk at the end of the conference on consumption and how it undermines our values. Excellent. So, so did The boys are different than the girls. Well, okay, uh, yeah. depends, right? I mean, did she want to go on on, uh, on outdoor activities with you, or you just didn't ask her, or like, what's the deal there? She likes the outdoors. Okay. We go hiking in the woods around our house together. Okay. And if she wants to climb a mountain, hopefully I'll still be fit and strong enough to climb one by the time she's ready. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's true. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, how do you balance your work and family? Uh, because it seems like, and looking at your bio as I'm referring to it again, again, again and again, you have done a lot. You have authored books, you have written books, you have uh, edited books, uh, you speak, you do, you have traveled. So, how I mean, you you kept your relationship with your boys and girls, girl. Uh, like, how do you do that, and how can you, uh, how can we educate from your experience to other parents who have a challenging work life and families? Any good person who does a lot of hiking in the mountains knows it's important every twenty or thirty minutes to rest. And that's an important principle in my life also. As a Christian, I believe in keeping the Sabbath, Sunday. So we try not to work as a family on Sunday, but give ourselves to worship services and opportunities for relationship. We'll often go on a hike as a family on a Sunday afternoon. So finding ways in which to develop periods of of, of exercise and periods of work are an important thing for anybody to do, whatever their faith or background. We do take holidays together as a family. That's important in my mind as well. How often do you do that? Uh, at, at least two big holidays a year, one in the winter as part of the uh, Christmas celebrations that we keep. Mm -hmm and then once in the summer, probably toward the end of August, usually. Okay, excellent. So, and they are willingly going on these vacations, or are they reluctantly going? But we entice them. Okay, you entice them. I, I set the scales. Uh -huh. It's hard to object to a cruise or to Disney World, no matter what your age is. That's true, that's true. 
That's good. So who is more willing, your daughter or your three boys? Or are, And you have three boys, so are they also, I'm sure, different than each other in terms of what they like and if they're outdoorish? Or... Each is very, very different. My oldest son is a laser physicist. He has a Ph.D. in that. Mm -hmm. My next son is interested in Christian ministry and service in society. My third son is interested in the, in the law and politics and the history of the United States. And my daughter is interested in the arts. She plays the violin, sings, dances, composes music. Mm -hmm. Did they all choose their fields, their interests themselves, or did you direct them in any way? No, they all chose their own field of interest. Did you ever say, well, do you, why don't you do this or that? Uh, why don't you try to be an engineer or a doctor or something? No, I ha not really. I think it's very important for a person to find their passion and pursue it. That's more important than a particular job. Mm. If you can follow your passion, the job will follow. So how do you uh, dis define passion? What gets your blood moving in the morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, when did you become a parent? At what age, if you... In my early 30s. And were you prepared to be a father at that time? I don't think anybody is ever prepared <laughs> for children. <laughs> okay. But did you, like, educate yourself, or were you really... Or you just had to become a dad, or you just, like, like were, were prepared, like, okay, now I'm going to have children. Like, were you prepared to have at least uh, your, uh, you know, begin with? I suppose to some extent I prepared myself, but there's something very existential and demanding about having a child. Um, you can read all the books in the world, but there's nothing that compares with the actual event. Mm -hmm. So uh, what? So you, let's say now you became a, do a father, and then did you did the children? or your relationship from the very beginning fall into the category of somewhat that you knew, or was it a total surprise for you to have children? Or, uh, like, I, I, I will not, I'm not talking about your wife yet, I, I'm to, as a father. Like, what would you advise to other fathers that what should they be prepared if they're consciously becoming fathers, or should they not think about it and just, you know, dive into no, I think for me, at least my experience was being part of a large extended family mm -hmm. so that in uncles and aunts and in relatives, I could see what was done with children and I could watch their progress and growth and maturation so that rather than read books about it, I think I was exposed to the reality of it through a large extended family. Obviously, you're not saying not to read it, but at least read and then try to find... Visualize. Visualize them, yeah. okay. And I don't know if we have extended families nowadays in the United States that we can learn from or have the experience that you were uh, privileged or uh, lucky enough to have. It's very hard in the United States today, both with our emphasis upon individualism as well as the emphasis upon going where you will to find yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you have to be intentional. I just came from a wedding in New Jersey mm -hmm. with several hundred people, about a hundred of which were relatives, uncles, aunts, grandparents, grandmothers, my relatives, and, and children. And we made an effort to at attend uh, from Boston People came from Colorado, from Chicago. I think today you have to make an intention to develop a strong family network. You mean before it was just automatic, everybody was in the process of having... Everybody lived near each other or together. Now it's not so much the case. We may be near each other with a phone or an iPhone or whatever, but we're not face-to-face -face with people. Did you have, um, when you were becoming or going to have children, did you have any pressures from the society like other uh, in other cultures and societies, sometimes they have pressure as soon as you are married, you should, you're supposed to have children. 
Did you have anything of that kind in your life? No, I had no pressure. Okay. So your wife and you were ready to have children at the time you had. Right. Yeah. It was something that we were open to that we would that we did not want to close the door to. So have you inculcated in your parenting what your parents did from educating, teaching, having this relationship that you have? Has anything come from your parents or this is your all your own effort? I think the importance of relationship has always been stressed in the family, both the particular family and the extended family. I think our understanding of faith and what what faith is is a family virtue that I picked up not only at church but in the course of time in our family as well. Even today, my wife and I and my sons, if they're available, or daughter, read a little snippet in the morning from our daily bread, which is a, like a Bible meditation, and we pray for each other through the course of the day. Which Bible do you read? Any particular uh, name that you can share? Um, anyone that's available, Greek, Hebrew, or New International English Version. Okay, so mostly which do you... Uh... <laughs> the New International Version usually, yeah. Okay. Would you mind telling me what uh, denomination of Christianity do you uh, follow? or? I'm a bit of a hybrid. Um, I am an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA, mm -hmm. but I draw deeply from all denominations, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, mm -hmm. and I find myself impressed with the wisdom of interfaith traditions, um, the emphasis on prophetism in Islam, mm -hmm. the emphasis upon identity and history in Judaism, upon wisdom in Buddhism. I could go on. Oh, wow. So uh, do your children, uh, are they open the way you are to other faiths and denominations in, within Christianity first and then to other faiths? I think so. Mm -hmm. Do they exercise in some way that you can see that or... Well, CMM runs a program called the Interfaith Youth Initiative, and all of my children have participated in that. Okay. That's an effort to understand the faith of other people and how it informs their social activities. Mm -hmm. Coming to another question, uh, why did you have children? I'm going to give you probably an answer you won't hear from many people. Okay, that would be good. <laughs> it's grounded in my faith. Um, there was an icon done by the Russian painter Rublov of the Trinity with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit looking into the eyes of each other. And out of that relationship comes love. And when you're married I was going to say to the right person. I, I'm not sure how to put it. <laughs> Hopefully, in the relationship one has with one's spouse, mm -hmm. one can look into the eyes of one's spouse and see love. Mm. And a child is the embodiment of that love. Mm. So you have already gone to the next topic of mine, but that's fine. This is really good. I, I want you to continue because it's coming in the flow. So yeah, because I, I am very big on relationships too, and I do want to know about relationships and how uh, one can, you know, improve and make them uh, more passionate or lovable, and that the way you're saying it, that you should be able to look in your spouse's eyes, and you know, and that's the embodiment of uh, your love that comes out of this relationship. That's really nicely said. So continue, please, if you want to say anything else on it. No, go ahead with your next so, question. Okay, so that's why you had, um, well, yeah, but it wasn't for any particular purpose, like uh, in some countries uh, children are used for the earning, when that's a different uh, socioeconomic reason. 
uh, then there are children. In this country, you have to pay for the children <laughs> through college. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you have less children. What made you have four children? Uh, is there any reason you have four children, or you could have had two? Or I'm not sure we really thought about it so carefully. After the boys came, it was nice to have a daughter. Okay, that's nice. Good, good. Um, so do you love your children unconditionally? Or do you have any... I would like to say I love them unconditionally. Have you? Do you consciously know, have you ever put conditions on your sons to do anything that you want them to do? I was taught not to through the following illustration. This was back in the days of, uh, of electronic calendars. They were just coming into being. Mm -hmm. And one of my boys got a hold of my electronic calendar and erased all of my appointments. Oh. I was livid. <laughs> I went upstairs to his bedroom and I said, what did you think you were doing uh -huh. as I raised my voice? Uh -huh. After some silence, he looked at me plaintively. I was just trying to schedule more time for us. Oh, wow. What could when I, did this happen? So maybe the, after that you have started having more vacation time, or was it... No, but this was about 10 years ago. Okay, so this is the youngest son, or the oldest, or the middle? The m middle son, yeah. Were you not spending enough time with him? I guess not, <laughs> at, least in his, at least in his opinion, you know. What do you think enough is? I think that depends on the chemistry of the situation. Hopefully, good parenting involves listening, and listening means knowing when to be quiet or knowing when to leave and when to intervene. Listening is very important. It's a very important skill. We don't do enough of it in our society. I'm trying to learn, too, so this will help me. <laughs> That's good. Um, do you learn from your children? Well, I learned my iPhone skills from my children. <laughs> Anything like when you have conversations or their ideology or their thoughts are different than you, do you agree or encourage them even if you don't want to believe or agree in for yourself? But do you, um, or uh, are there any instances that you can mention that you have learned something from your son or daughter and then you have used it in your life or have changed your thought process in some way? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think it's important to allow our children to change us. It means taking them seriously. Mm. So you're not an authoritative parent, I guess, then? Well, I might be authoritative in some ways, but that doesn't mean I'm not a listening parent. Um, I think of the talk that my daughter gave in Assisi mm -hmm. at this conference oh, last summer. Oh, she did summer. that too. She spoke for 10 minutes on the problems of consumption and overspending and how that undermines our values as a people. I, I guess I need to talk to your daughter too. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just striking to hear such wisdom come out of the mouth, excuse me, of babes. Um, my youngest son is very committed to social causes, especially Black Lives Matter. And he's going to be working in a women's prison this uh, fall as a project for his college. I think my daughter, just to come back to her for a moment, reminds me of the fact that, we, that the world that we're creating is the world that our children will inherit. So we look at the devastation of climate change and what it means with storms like Harvey, et cetera. So uh, do you believe that um, children come through us? It's a both-and answer that I give you. I believe both in nature as well as nurture. By coming through us or through me or my wife, very graphically. I understand nature in process. 
a child is always a mixture of the parents, of the mother and the father. There is a certain nature that is given the child by the parents. But there's also nurture that's important. And the nurture begins not as the child exits the womb, but the nurture can begin even while the child is in the bowels of the mother through music, care, emotion, attitudes. I could go on. These become increasingly important when the child begins to grow and to learn him or herself. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's a both and, na nature and nurture. Yes, but what I would like also to ask you, like once, because parents, when have their children, they think they own them and they are theirs, you know, and then they want them to have uh, or, or uh, mirror whatever they think it is supposed to be. Like they want their children to be like nowadays, like, you know, be in 10 activities or seven activities and do this and that and whatever you want, you get it through them. Do you... Would you let them grow on their own the way I actually have answered previously? So it seems like you have been doing that. Let them do what they want to do, choose their own careers or their fields or areas. But still, do you really believe in that? or? Well, I believe in progressive independence. As the child matures, so one can extend greater degrees of independence. Where that point is, is one of mutual education, I would say. The child is teaching something to the parent, even as the parent is teaching something to the child. Mm -hmm. um, the parents own the child, mm -hmm. but the child owns the parents. Hmm. And how that is negotiated and played out with spheres of freedom and independence becomes the definition of maturity. Parents can be immature and feel like they own their children. Yeah. Children can be immature and not regard the ownership of parents. So it is a question of maturity and maturation. So how can you achieve that? If, it, if you can just briefly tell me if there is anything that you can quickly suggest. Well, I think that's done primarily through listening. As you listen, you learn to communicate. Taking the time to communicate is important because that builds relationship. Relationship needs encouragement. So I would say these three points are vital. Listening, which promotes communication. Relationship, which grows in relationship to communication. And encouragement, which is the nurturing soil for growth. So... Uh, I would hope that all the parents would really listen to what you have said and uh, and be people who are planning to be parents and who are not parents yet or who does, don't even want to be parents, but at least it's a good advice for us as adults to deal with other people. Listening is uh, applicable in all relationships. I think you've said the conclusion right there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for staying with me through this exciting episode. Please don't forget to subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode of Light Up with Schwa.